Good afternoon, and welcome to the celebration, the first time that Jim Butler is sitting in the jury box. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone here today. My name is Bo Rutledge, and I'm the dean of the law school. And it's a pleasure to see so many people who have traveled from so many places to help us celebrate Jim Butler. We gather today to dedicate the James E. Butler courtroom at the University of Georgia School of Law honoring three generations of this family, including Jim's father, a decorated naval pilot whose photo sits in this bookshelf to my left. And that makes today Veterans Day an especially fitting one for this tribute. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge many of the guests who are here today, University of Georgia President Jerry W. Moorhead, an alumnus of our school, and longtime director of its advocacy program. Numerous members of the state and federal judiciary, some of whom Jim has appeared before. Former deans Rebecca Hanner White and David Shipley, and both of you helped to build the relationship between Jim and this law school during your years of service. And so too did former Dean Ron Ellington, who wanted to be here today but was unable to attend due to a family commitment. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the presence of Associate Dean Emeritus Paul Kurtz, the advocacy director once known as Hoyt, who supported Jim during his years setting records in the law school's critically acclaimed advocacy program, including when Jim became the first person in the history of the University of Georgia School of Law to win the first year Russell Moot Court competition and the second year Talmadge Moot Court competition, the finals of which happen to be taking place this very moment. I'd also like to welcome Jim's family and colleagues, one of whom, Joel Wooten, his longtime law partner, will introduce the family to you during his remarks in a moment. He will be followed by Jim's son, Jeb, an alumnus of the law school and already a very successful attorney in Atlanta. For now, for these few moments, I'd like to speak to you about the subject of impact. Specifically, Jim Butler's impact inside the courtroom and outside the courtroom. Inside the courtroom, Jim is known as a fierce advocate for his clients, a hardworking voice for the voiceless, voiceless and a formidable competitor. Four times over his career, Jim was lead counsel in a case that set the record for the largest verdict in the history in the state of Georgia. He has litigated cases in 31 states and served as lead counsel in five where the verdict exceeded $100 million. Some of those cases are subjects of the headlines hanging in the foyer outside the James E. Butler courtroom. But Jim's impact in the courtroom is measured by far more than the size of a headline or a verdict. It is found in the very texture and fabric of the lives of the families and the clients whom he has represented. Federal Judge Rick Story once said that notwithstanding the size of his docket, he approaches each and every case with a keen awareness that for the people before him, that case is likely the most important matter in their lives and the lives of their families. And that same philosophy, no doubt, has infused and continues to infuse Jim's work as a lawyer. Behind those headlines, behind those verdicts, stand families with names like Mosley, with names like Walden, whose lives were forever changed by some societal wrong, and who perhaps found comfort in the passionate and tireless courtroom advocacy of their counsel, Jim Butler. Outside of the courtroom, Jim has ranked among the law school's finest friends. His support has set the standard for transformational giving here at the law school. He personally has endowed one of the law school's marquee scholarships, and along with his partners, helped to create the Sikh Voss non Vobis Scholarship through a settlement remainder fund. By gifts of this sort, Jim has allowed students to work toward their law degrees, to pursue, to pursue their own dreams, inspired by his example, 
and not laboring under the specter of debt over them after graduation. Along with several others here today, Jim formed part of a group that helped launch last year's Challenge Fund, an unprecedented initiative that successfully doubled the law school's annual fund in a single year and thereby enabled the law school to offer 66 new scholarships to deserving students. Just like the impact of Jim's courtroom success, the impact of his friendship to the law school is also about more than numbers. It is about people. Butler scholars like Texas Morris, who now give voice to the voiceless as a public defender in Birmingham, Alabama. Here in this courtroom today are several students who currently benefit from Jim's support. The current Butler scholar, Grace Liu, and several Sikh Voss scholars, including Campbell Brantley, Emily Esco, Christopher Johnson, Oliver Ladd, Curtis Lockaby, Megan McDonough, Cody Schubert, and Courtney Smith. Each of them comes to law school with a dream, and through this sort of support, Jim helps them realize it. Given Jim's impact inside the courtroom and outside the courtroom, there is no more place, more fitting for us to gather to honor Jim than the James E. Butler courtroom at the University of Georgia School of Law. Today and henceforth, in this place, present and future students will hone their advocacy skills and learn from judges and be reminded of a great courtroom lawyer and the values he represents. Jim Butler's investment in this institution and in his society is an investment in the people whose lives he touches and who will reflect the values as they join him in a noble profession. They are walking monuments to Jim's legacy, much like this courtroom is a physical monument to the place where Jim Butler planted his flag and built his reputation as one of the nation's finest lawyers. And so to offer a few words about this great lawyer, let me invite to the podium his longtime partner and a true friend of the law school, Mr. Joel Wooten. With this many judges in the courtroom, I think I have to start off by saying, may it please the court. <laughs> President Moorhead, Dean Rutledge, distinguished members, many distinguished members of our state and federal judiciary, fellow lawyers, law students, members of the faculty, former members of the faculty, Butler family, and the many, many distinguished friends of Jim Butler. And, and y'all are only a few of the many friends of Jim. Uh, wish all of them could be here today, but there aren't enough seats in the law school to, uh, to, to hold all of them. What a remarkable, wonderful occasion. It is really a privilege and an honor for me to be here and to take part in this and to honor my longtime friend and my longtime law partner for a lifetime of service to our profession and to this law school. Before I start, I want to, uh, I want to recognize some of his family that's here today. First, uh, who will be speaking when I finish, his son Jeb and Jeb's wife Ann. And Ann is about, is expecting with Jim's second grandchild. Uh, daughter Emily and her husband Justin Patterson and first grandchild, granddaughter Mary Catherine. Daughter Catherine and David Gunter. Brother Dennis, I know Dennis is here. Dennis's wife, Judy. Uh, and a very, very special person in Jim's life, Kim Harris and her daughter, Ava Grace. Jim is not only a great lawyer, he's a great brother, an involved father, and a wonderful grandfather, although he's still in the learning phase on that. <laughs> Boy, it's a good thing we're among friends because I see that Jim's got the uh, closing argument. 
<laughs> That's never a good thing if you're a defendant. I first met Jim when, uh, I guess, fall quarter of 1969. I was a sophomore, and he was a sophomore at the uh, university. Jim was a journalism major. He was a member of Sigma Phi Epsilon and later president. I was a business major, and we both had mutual interest in politics and student government. Over the next three years, we just kept running into each other, one event or another, and we became friends. It was in Athens that Jim and I first began, or at least I first began, Jim probably knew it earlier, began to realize that life was all about relationships. And we made some great relationships then. Folks like Dan Amos, uh, Terry Sullivan, uh, many, many others, people that we would, would run into. Some were former law partners, some were, were co-counsel, uh, some were even defense counsel that we're still friends with. In 1972, Jim and I graduated. Jim with a journalism degree, myself with a business degree. Jim had to make a decision. He had always wanted to go to law school, but he thought he would, uh, he would make some money first. Well, he had offers to be a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or the Gwinnett Daily News, and then he, I'm sure he had been publisher in a couple, in three or four years. His choice was to go build houses in Forsyth County. <laughs> and many of y'all don't know this, but Jim is, is quite a builder quite a contractor, very talented. He became a builder and he built 44 houses until he was caught up in the real estate recession, major real estate recession of the 1970s. And about half of y'all are too young to remember that. You think y'all have gone through a recession. Well, in the 1970s, we had double-digit interest rates. I'm not talking about 10 or 12 percent. I'm talking about 16, 18, 22 percent. No one could borrow money. The Dow Jones went down between 40 and 45 percent. Had double digit inflation. Go figure. That doomed most of the construction industry, including a very bright young builder in Forsyth County, because no one was buying or building houses. I'd started law school in the fall of 1972, and sometime in 1973, I get a call from my friend Jim Butler asking how I like law school. It was time for a change of career. Shortly thereafter, Jim applied and was accepted to Harvard University School of Law and to the University of Georgia School of Law. As I said, Jim is very bright. <laughs> and I mentioned relationships earlier. There's, much, there's a lot to be said about relationships. At that time, Judge Griffin Bell chaired a scholarship committee for a University of Georgia scholarship, the Woodruff. And it was Judge Bell's scholarship committee that selected Jim for a full academic scholarship at Georgia. He turned down the scholarship at Harvard, and thankfully he chose to come back to Athens. That was good news to many of us for many, many reasons. Later, Judge Bell, and this in the small world, was on the other side of cases with us, but Judge Bell sponsored and signed Jim's application for admittance to practice before the United States Supreme Court. Once in law school, Jim was a natural. And Bo, I think you read my remarks. Uh, he studied hard, he prepared diligently, he made excellent grades, he watched, he learned. He won the first year Russell competition. Some folks said it was because I was chair. <laughs> <laughs> but then he went on and won the Talmadge competition he was the outstanding team member of the uh, Southern Moot Court team. They won the competition. He was best oralist. He was a member of the National Moot Court, excuse me, the National uh, Moot Court team, and he graduated from law school with honors. 
During his third year of law school, there's a repetition here. Jim called and wanted to know how I like practicing in Columbus. I told him it was great. We had good judges, we had great lawyers, and more importantly, I was about to try my second jury trial. That caught his interest. Jim had offers from most of the big, most if not all of the big firms in Atlanta, but he chose to come to Columbus to practice law because we tried cases down there back in the 70s and 80s. And sure enough, we kept running into each other. A couple of years later, after he had, uh, had, had been with the firm he started, Jim started his own firm. He tried case after case after case. And folks, folks find it hard to believe today because most lawyers rarely ever try a case. Jim has tried approximately 200 trials to jury verdict. Very few folks have done that. Maybe a few criminal prosecutors. He's won numerous seven, eight, nine-figure verdicts. And Bo, you said he set the uh, verdict record in four different types of cases in Georgia. First in med malpractice, second in trucking, third in products liability, fourth in business torts. And he's come along since then and broken his own records. Jim is recognized as one of the premier trial lawyers in the country. He's handled cases all over the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast and all points in between. Out in the West, the Midwest, the Southwest, the South, the Northeast. He's been lead counsel in five cases where the verdict exceeded $100 million. Most lawyers can't fathom that. They can't conceive, if, the, if they have one verdict in excess of $100 million, that would be a, a great lifetime accomplishment. Jim's had five and more to come. I'm not going to, going to go into Jim's biography. His, all of his bio materials on our website if you have a few minutes <laughs> and want to look at it, along with some of his successes. I will say a few things, though. Jim does a lot other than the practice of law. He's been president of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. He's been a member of the board of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. He was the first recipient of the Daily Reports, the inaugural recipient of their Lifetime Achievement Award. And he's won the State Bar Tradition of Excellence Award, which is given by his peers. Truly an honor. What I want to talk about today are things that make Jim an outstanding lawyer, but more importantly, an outstanding person. I've had the pleasure of knowing Jim now for 47 years. He's much younger than I am, though. <laughs> he reminds me constantly. First as a fellow student here in Athens, uh, a longtime friend, a hunting companion, once upon a time, a defense lawyer on the other side of cases with Jim. That was always interesting, <laughs> like, like, a, like a chess match. And for the last 28 years as his law partner. As many of you know, Jim is what some folks call a recovering journalist. He loves to write, and he writes exceptionally well. He also loves to train young lawyers to write but more importantly, to think clearly and to think and write concisely, to communicate. Jim also believes in preparation. When Jim takes a case, he plans to try it. He plans to take it to jury verdict, and that's how he prepares it. I don't think he's ever taken a case saying, we'll send a letter, we'll settle it, and move on to the next one. He prepares his pleadings, his depositions, his briefs, his hearings meticulously. His work ethic and preparation with folks that know him are legendary. He will do multiple drafts of a complaint. Some folks in the office say he will do multiple edits of a perfectly good brief. 
to make it better and better and shorter and clearer and more concise. As I said, he is a recovering journalist. He's never gotten over it. But he stresses communication, communication, communication. If you don't communicate your message, it's not the reader's fault, it's yours. Jim always wants to be totally prepared so he can react swiftly when the opportunity arises, or as Jim calls it, when you see the dangling flank. No defense lawyer has ever outworked or outthought or outprepared him. Some folks say Jim has been lucky, but our firm's definition of luck is quote unquote, opportunity meeting preparation. And that defines Jim and Jim's life and his law practice. Jim has a mission, Bo touched on it, to make a difference in the world, whether it's making cars safer by pursuing products liability cases and reducing the death rate on our highways or by passionately pursuing corporations who abuse others. Sometimes we call it lying, cheating, and stealing. <laughs> That's South Georgia slang. To convince defendants that there are adverse consequences for not doing the right thing. And Jim's one of the best at that. He can craft an argument. He can talk to the most learned judge. And he can talk to a jury and they all understand him. They all know where he's going and how he got there and what he wants them to do. It's a real talent. Jim also enjoys life. He enjoys the practice of law and it shows, but he has many, many interests outside the law. As I told you, he's a recovering journalist. He's also a recovering builder and a developer. He really enjoys taking time to be with his family. He loves to work his bird dogs and to hunt quail on his place in South Georgia. He loves to fish, he loves to fish out west, hunt all over the country, all over the world. He loves to travel. He's an avid reader. He's a student of poli politics and he's a policy wonk. He's constantly thinking. Um, and he loves email. <laughs> I get more emails from Jim Butler than from the rest of the folks in my law firm combined by a factor of two or three. <laughs> he loves history, particularly military history. And he is a student, a serious student of Civil War strategy. He's an environmentalist. I told you he was on the Natural Resources Board. But Jim thinks seriously about conservation and about the environment and what we are doing to our state and our country and our world. Jim's loyal. He's loyal to his clients. He's loyal to his friends. And several of his closest friends are here today. I see Emory. I see Bill Stone. I see, I see many others in the, uh, in the courtroom. If you are Jim's friend, you know that you can always, bold, underscore, 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 always count on Jim. He's also loyal to his employees. Several of our staff members, our team members, are like family. I don't know, him. We, we've got a number that have been with us for over 25 years. 20, over 20 years. Some over 25 years. Some over 25, 20 over 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> One over 28. <laughs> but they are an integral part of our practice and they are a team. And that's another thing Jim stresses is teamwork. No one does it by themselves. Everyone works together. Our folks will be down there. We're getting ready for a trial. They'll be down there till seven or eight o'clock. They don't have to come in on Saturdays or Sundays. They just do. You'll see them Saturdays. You'll see them Sunday afternoon after church. Want asking, what can I do? How can I help? What needs to be done? 
that's part of the, part of the reason that they have been there that long. They're also very successful, successful, but part of it is also because they know Jim is loyal to them and they are loyal to him. And Jim is generous. This courtroom is one example. There are many others. Bo mentioned scholarships here at the law school, uh, scholarships in the School of Ecology. There's a scholarship fund at Columbus State University for servant leadership. Substantial donations by Jim to, to many environmental, many community organizations around the state and the southeast. And also a lot of time that Jim spends encouraging and helping others, especially young lawyers. The hanging of Jim's porch today is significant because it memorializes the meaningful life of James Edward Butler, Jr. And it reminds us and future Georgians when we come into this building of a great lawyer, but more importantly, a life of purpose and a life well lived. Jim is a great example of the best of what a University of Georgia graduate can be. Successful, compassionate, a gifted, dedicated trial lawyer, and a citizen of Georgia and the world who has done well by doing right. It's been a real pleasure to share with you today and to be here. I'll finish with a quote from the book Sartor Resartus by distinguished philosopher Sir Thomas Carlyle, sic vos non vobis, not for ourselves, but for others. Jim epitomizes that saying in his work, in his life, and in his generosity to others. Please join me in paying tribute today after Jeb has a chance to talk for a lifetime of outstanding personal and professional achievements and for his dedicated service to the profession, to this law school, to our university, our state, and our country. Jim, thank you for letting me say a few words. Good afternoon. Um, as you all know, I practice law in Atlanta, and it's not unusual for lawyers, particularly young lawyers, but sometimes older ones, to come up to me and ask what it is that makes uh, my father so special in, in this profession. And I never have come up with a real good answer. Uh, the best answer I've ever heard came from my dad's former partner and now uh, federal judge Lee May, who, when introducing him one time, says, I want to introduce my, my law partner, Jim Butler, who doesn't know what his secret is. <laughs> and I think that that's true. Um, the best answer that I've come up with on my own is that he does what other lawyers just say they're going to do. I'm going to give a few examples of that. Um, many lawyers, particularly plaintiff's lawyers like us, like to talk about how they get invested in the facts of the case, in the justice of a case, in the way the facts of a case reflect society as a whole, the way real people are affected by what happened in that case. But to a lot of lawyers, that's not really what they're thinking about. With my dad, I mean, it is. The practice of law to him, I know, has never been, as it is to some, a financial game, but has instead been and an ability and an opportunity to right wrongs. I remember as a boy, um, a, lot of, a lot of what I learned as a boy, I learned in Dad's pickup truck. We'd be driving from Columbus, Georgia, down to Stewart County, where we'd go hunting and fishing, and I would hear about his cases uh, on the way down there just because it was on his mind and I was interested in it, so we'd talk about it. And I would hear about, you know, the Tompkins case in Columbus, Georgia, where some folks tried to um, steal an old lady's land, really, and he stopped him, stopped him cold, never, so far as I know, earned a dime from that case. I'd hear about um, the, the quarry case. There was a quarry there in Columbus that was, you know, conducting shocks and blowing up rocks and stuff and uh, messing up the foundation to someone's house who, who lived on our street. Uh, and he loved talking about that, stop that cold. And I don't know 
I don't know that he charged a fee uh, in that case. What I remember most in terms of the systemic problems he would talk about when we were going hunting, this is in the, I guess, uh, late 80s, early to mid 1990s, really, um, were the car cases. You know, for years, they had handled a whole <laughs> bunch of these GM side saddle pickup truck cases where General Motors had for decades got the fuel tank on the truck and they put it right there on the outside, outside the frame rail. So if it got rear ended, truck blow up, it'll burn alive. And he handled some of these cases. And it just, it always, I don't think he ever came to understand how this could be, but it, it bug, bugged him then and bugs him now, I think, that the people who designed those trucks absolutely knew what would happen and did not care. It just drove him wild. Um, and he eventually drove them wild, hammering on them, <laughs> getting after it. You know, because they would sit there, they'd hire these experts and these lawyers to sit there and say, we didn't know this was a problem, which was a lie. And, and we care about our, our people, which was apparently also a lie. Which brings me to my second thing that a lot of lawyers say, uh, but few lawyers put into practice, at least to this degree, and that is never mislead a judge or a jury. Um, Mr. Wooten stood up here and talked about some of the briefs, and, I, and that's an excellent segue to make this point. When I, I worked at Butler Wooten for three and a half years before starting my own law firm, and if you're writing briefs with Dad on the case, he's going to be checking your citations. If you have cited a case in there and he reads it and he doesn't find what you said it says, you're going to hear about it. And this happens more often when the defense writes a brief. He's going to be reading their cases too. And if they're wrong, the judge is going to hear about it. Because never mislead a judge or a jury. So woe be to the defense expert who tries to do those things. Um, Last year, Dad and I tried to verdict a, a case involving a, a Chrysler gas tank they put in the extreme rear of a vehicle. It would get hit, people would burn up. You, you'd think they would learn, they don't. But uh, they had hired this expert whose job was to say, nope, you know, uh, Chrysler designed these things and there was no problem with them, which was not true. They didn't know about any of this stuff, which was not true. And the guy kept pushing it. He eventually took it too far. So he'd drawn this little diagram that he was going to show to the jury of the various parts on the back of this car. But he changed the name on one of them. If you looked at the engineering description, it described this little plate on the back as a cosmetic fascia, a little plastic piece. But in the exhibit for the jury, the guy called it like protective shield. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the deposition, you know, with Dad, and uh, we're in Detroit taking it. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for getting after this guy. I don't mind a little blood and gore in my law practice. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all for it. But Dad started in on that, that guy who earned it. I mean, he's trying to mislead a jury. But if you imagine each, each question <laughs> as an arrow, that darn witness looked like a porcupine at the end, <laughs> except the pointy parts were pointing in. <laughs> it isn't all in dad's law practice, um, it isn't all blood and knuckles. I mean, if you, if you tell the truth, you're going to be good with Jim Butler. And that's true for witnesses. It's true for defense lawyers. Um, I remember a story of, uh, involving Tom Carlock. Uh, this was before I was practicing law, long before I was practicing law. But dad and uh, Tom Carlock, who's a well-known defense lawyer, were trying a case, I think, in Columbus. And they got along well. Tom Carlock was a straight shooter, so was my father. So they agreed before trial uh, that they would just rule on each other's objections. So if Tom Carlock's up there and he asks, Mr. Witness, now what did so-and-so say about that? Then they have to say, no, no, hang on. Go up and say, now, Tom, you know that's hearsay. And Tom would have to withdraw the question, you know. <laughs> they ruled on each other's objections. And tell the truth and shoot straight, and you'll be good with Jim Butler, right? He's maintained a lot of good relationships with a lot of defense lawyers for a long time by doing those things. And if you do the things that most lawyers just say they do, like care about the fundamental justice of your case, like stick always to the truth, you will inspire people. Uh, and, and he has. I mean, uh, when I was a boy, I'd go into his, his law office you know, for whatever reason, I don't know, after school or something. The people 
that I knew then who I would say, you know, where did y'all hide the Coca-Cola today? They're still there. I mean, Joel Hooten's still practicing with it. Beth Glenn's still there. Brenda, uh, Brenda's still there. People have stuck with him for a long, long time. There's people here, many, uh, who've been very tight with my father since long before I was born. That's 34 years ago. Um, living his life and practicing law as he has inspires folks. And that is as it should be. It has inspired me. Um, I'll tell one final story. The, I talked about the Jeep case. Dad and I tried together about, about two weeks uh, long last year. And we knew it had gone pretty good. You know, we were sitting there waiting on, on the verdict. And the, the jury says, you know, we got a verdict. So we all rush into the room, and I'm standing there at the table uh, next to Dad in the Four person comes back and they read the verdict, and it was a hundred fifty million dollar verdict, um, which you know is very nice for for Dad. It, it was an interesting thing because it had been over ten years since his last hundred million dollar verdict. I mean that's a strange thing to say for a lawyer, but for him that was that was a long time. Um, so the jury comes back and reads it, and you know what? I'm a young guy. I hadn't tried. I've tried some cases since, but at the time had not tried very many. And there's all sorts of things that might go through a young lawyer's mind when a trial, in which he's been so involved, comes back with such a verdict. Um, you know, you might think of your clients. You might think of the systemic good that such a verdict will do. And in fact, it did. Those, those vehicles got recalled. You might think of the money. You might think of your own reputation. But what this surprised me, the first thing that went through my mind was I was happy for my dad. Um, for his first in over 10 years. I mean, <laughs> the man has inspired many people, and I'm among them. It is, it is very deserving, I think, that we are gathered here today. Uh, for my father has earned the respect, the affection, and the love that we in this room hold for him. Thank you. I'll help you out. I'm worried about my family. Right. Yeah, that's not what y'all do. All right, I think you're good. For you young lawyer, law students here, um, one of the things I've always lectured at seminars is always use notes. Churchill did. Abraham Lincoln did. John F. Kennedy did. Uh, they're pretty good speakers. I always use notes, particularly for some event like this, because I always forget somebody. I'm notorious for forgetting somebody. Uh, thank you, uh, Bo. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Jeb. Those are very nice comments. I didn't really realize what a great guy I was. <laughs> <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of reassuring. <laughs> My old buddy Gerald Davidson out there knows different, but you be quiet. <laughs> um, let me first, I, I want to thank a bunch of people. I want to first thank Beth Stevens, the artist. Beth, would you stand up? Um, This is a piece of art. It really is. <laughs> it is far better than the original. <laughs> but it's not so much different than the original that would cause genteel people to say anything about that. <laughs> it's pretty close. It made me much prettier than I really am. Thank you so much, Beth. Thanks also to the law school for this honor. Uh, I don't want to be like some people that um, when they get some sort of honor, they soon forget that 
they might have even been based on something other than their own, their own merit, you know, like they knew somebody or something. But, uh, and I do want to acknowledge that I realize that contributions to the law school have something to do with this. And the fact that thus far I've been able to get through life without doing anything so terribly embarrassing that the law school would be unwilling <laughs> to do this. I just hope I can keep it up. So but thank you so much to the folks here at the law school. To say that this law school has meant the world to me would be an understatement. To quote one of my favorite movies, Tombstone, I ain't got the words. <laughs> um, since I was a little kid, I've always um, um, been real queasy about events like this where I'm the focus. It makes me very nervous. You know, I'm a big believer and there's always another shoe going to fall. And, uh, so it makes me very nervous. I, when I was a young kid, I made my parents quit having birthdays for me, birthday parties. I don't like this kind of stuff. Uh, and I agreed to do this mainly because I do hope that young lawyers here at the law school will read some of this stuff and think that maybe they can make a difference or at least try to. That's, that's the point. Uh, that's the purpose. Thank you, President Moorhead. Uh, thank you, Bo. Thank you, Ron Ellington, my dear friend who couldn't be here today. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, David. Um, all these deans have worked with me for the last 20 years uh, about contributions, and, and this business of a courtroom has been going on for at least 10 years. We're finally here today. Um, and thanks to Ann Moser and um, Laura Pulliam and cousin Carrie Butler for their work in, in putting this event on. Uh, thank all of y'all for coming. I, I would not let the law school invite many people. My standard was family and people who I knew were going to be in Athens anyway <laughs> or, who, or who live here. Laurel will tell you. I wouldn't do it because I don't want to inconvenience anybody. Um, I start with my beloved Kim Kofer Harris, who's here with her lovely daughter Ava, who's now 11. Um, Kim and Ava mean a lot to me. Kim's made a big difference in my life. She is the most relentlessly positive person I've ever known. She's also a graduate of this law school, and she's living proof um, that uh, defense lawyers can like me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of friends who are defense lawyers, contrary to conventional wisdom. Uh, and what most people think. And I, I've thought a lot about that over the years. And uh, for whatever it's worth, a little philosophy. Um, for many people, their perceptions of others have more to do with their own projections than with reality. It's amazing to me how we're all subject to it, to one degree or another. I fight against it all the time. We all have our filters that interfere with our ability to accurately perceive others as they really are. All right, end of philosophy. <laughs> Thanks to my children for coming here. Uh, Jeb and Ann, Emily and Justin, um, Catherine and David, Catherine the second. <laughs> Let me tell you something. People always told me having grandchildren would be cool. It is. But just as cool as having a first grandchild is the fact that my eldest daughter, Emily, chose to name her daughter after my youngest daughter, Catherine. That's cool. <laughs> One of my goals as a parent was to, and all of y'all have done this, try to get your kids together. Try to get your kids together. It's not always easy. Um, my brother Dennis is here with his lovely wife Judy and her parents Teeny and Coach Dick, Dick Copus. Thank y'all for coming. Um, brothers are really important in life. Um, they were to my grandfather and his brothers, to my father who died in March, and to his brother who's in the hospital now. Uh, they, brothers of the blood and brothers of the spirit, I think, are sometimes a man's tether to life. And I've got a lot of brothers. While we're talking about my brothers, I'll talk about my best friend, Bill Stone, who's back here. And the rest of my family, we call them the Rocks, <laughs> the Stone family. There's, Bill had five children. Two of them are lawyers here today, Ryle Stone, James Stone. They're here. Ryle's here with his lovely wife, Lauren. Uh, Bill and I 
raised our kids together. Bill and I have been in so many battles of so many different types over the years. Some of y'all who know us know what, what I'm talking about. <laughs> Political, legal, and otherwise. And um, we've done well. On the child front, we are eight for eight, and we're rolling for 16 for 16 <laughs> and making good progress. I also want to thank some of the friends who are here who have been stuck with me for most of my life. Wes and Linda Walraven, who've been my friends for 49 years since I was 16 years old. Emery and Jeannie Lipscomb, who've been my friends for 46 years. Uh, Joel said I had turned down offers to um, uh, work at the AJC and the Gwent Daily News when I got out of journalism school and went back to coming and started building houses. Well, there's more to that than it seems. I was talking to Emory about you know, the offers that I had. When I did the news, Bob Fowler made me a hell of an offer. He'd make me publisher in four years, he said, and give me 10% of the company. And I'll never forget Emory said, Emory said, uh, hell, Butler, I'll pay you $150 a week just to run an office and talk politics. <laughs> <laughs> you know so we went, in, we went into the construction business. <laughs> Lanier, Georgia Corporation, later Jim Butler Construction Company. Um, I really want to thank Joel for those comments. Joel's been my friend for 47 years. Uh, we met as sophomores. I, I was in a bad wreck in the summer of 68 after I graduated from high school and had to go to Gaines, Virginia College my first year because I was on crutches. And, Anyway, I came over here as a sophomore, and um, um, I first met, my, met Joel uh, in pol campus politics. Uh, my assignment from some of, the, some of the old sages, you know, the seniors, was to go to the Convention of Student Representative As Assembly, SRA, and make sure Joel did not get nominated for vice president of the student body. <laughs> because they knew that... The, the party elders knew we were going to lose that year, and they didn't want him to be on a losing ticket. They wanted to save him for the next year. Uh, Dan Amos was in our, our party. We, we were all members of the, of the conservative campus political party doing battle against those raging liberals led by Terry Sullivan. <laughs> um, Dan and I were lieutenants in Joel Wooten's army, is the, is the truth of the matter. Right, Dan? That's right. Um, Thanks to my partners, my partners uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, Brandon, except for Joel, Brandon's getting ready for a trial Monday, and I told him this morning, you are not going to Athens. <laughs> uh, and I told Buddy and, and um, Teeter not to come to stay at work because it's not worth the trouble. <laughs> Al Pearson is here. My former partner, Al Pearson, who was my criminal law professor in, in law school. Um, professor of criminal law. Yes. <laughs> what was your job here, Hoyt? <laughs> Al's uh, most crowning achievement professionally is that he was Grand Coot of the Coot Hounds. No, he wasn't Grand you, you. You were, you, you were the faculty advisor. That's right, that's right. Tom Bauer from Gainesville was Grand, grand Coot. <laughs> My dear friends Rick and Slim Bridges here. Rick and, Rick and I were uh, uh, law school classmates. We were in Section Z, affectionately known as the zoo. <laughs> um, most important of all, even though I hadn't mentioned y'all yet, all these judges that are here, I need to recognize them because that's what I do for a living is I work for judges. <laughs> it's literally true, especially federal judges. You know, they don't have quite the same tolerance that state court judges do sometimes. And I work for federal judges full time. Clay Land, who's our federal judge, is here. I tried a case against Clay Land one time and uh, tried a case with him. Uh, he's down in Columbus. Steve Jones is here. We've got Lawton Stevens and the new justice, Mike Boggs from Waycross, Georgia. Billy Ray is here. Judge Ethelyn Simpson is here. Um, I've, tried, I've had cases in front of a lot of these judges. Uh, Steve Jones, uh, can you talk to the clerk? 
I want a case in front of you. <laughs> We're about to file one. Um, thank you all for coming. Joel mentioned um, loyalty. Um, um, uh, that's, a, that's a really important thing, and I wanted to mention that um, in the room today are, are two men who taught me a lot of what I know about loyalty when I was very young, Wes Walraven and Ember Lipscomb. Uh, I could go on about that, but we need to shut this down. Um, I'll tell you about loyalty. It's not common. Most people are loyal only so long as it is not disadvantageous to them. That's the truth. I can see how that approach might make some sense, the me-only approach. My problem is, and this is why I've thought so much about loyalty over the years, is that if you're like me and you make so many bad decisions, you need some loyal friends. <laughs> so I've tried to pay real attention to being loyal to my friends. This, uh, my portrait hangs here, but in my mind, this courtroom was named for, for three James E. Butlers. My father, who died in March, he was lieutenant commander, a U.S. Navy carrier fighter, fighter pilot, um, who taught me something invaluable, uh, taught me a lot of things invaluable. One that I think about nearly every day, I was thinking about this morning as I was doing the sixth draft of a reply brief. Um, anything worth doing is worth doing right. Uh, that's really important to lawyers. The courtroom is also for my son Jeb, whose decision to do as I have done or tried to do still chokes me up. Who, like me, is trying to change the world one case at a time. And who is a better man and a better lawyer than I've ever been. I have been incredibly lucky in life. I, I was blessed with intelligence, I'll admit that. I was, I was also blessed with the ability to work hard. That is a God-given talent, no different than Barbara Streisand's ability to sing. I didn't have anything to do with it. I've always been that way. And um, I've been lucky. I was, I, throughout life, I've been mostly very lucky. Moving to Columbus, Georgia was lucky. Dean Ralph Beard is the one that steered me down there because he said Columbus had the best trial bar in the South. I've tried cases all over the place. I've never seen a place that comes close. I mean, it was, what a great place to learn. And what a great, I was just lucky about when I came along. We tried cases. I tried 18 cases. Started 17 cases one year. Jury trials. Got 14 verdicts. Um, there is, yeah, it's, and it's still great fun. There seems to be a never-ending abundance of arrogant bad guys to bring to justice. Um, this, this is, uh, the, I think what I've been doing, what I, the job I've got is the greatest job in the world. Speaking of doing good, last night Clarence Ditlow, head of the Center for Oral Safety, died after a bout with cancer. Now y'all read about Clarence Ditlow if you get a chance in the newspapers. Uh, you want to talk about somebody who, who is sort of like Ralph Nader, who's done so much good. Now everybody's, Ralph, what he did in 2000, rankles some people the wrong way. But uh, those people, when it comes to automotive safety, they're saving tens of thousands of lives every year because of the work they've done over the lifetime. So I wanted to mention that. Thanks again to the law school for this great honor. I'm deeply honored. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Stevens for putting me up so well. And thanks to all of y'all for coming. <laughs>